Section 27 of the Watergate Report, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Final Report of the Senate's Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 1 chapter three use of incumbency responsiveness program part seven six resistance in the bureaucracy to the responsiveness concept as the previous section demonstrates the results of the responsiveness program were many and varied but the successes of the program were reduced because there was considerable resistance in the federal establishment to bending the system to fit re-election purposes without attempting to be exhaustive the following examples give a flavor of the recalcitrance of some federal officials to requests made of them by white house and campaign officials a the failure of the departments and agencies to submit responsiveness plans the basic document presenting the responsiveness concept the malik and haldeman memorandum of march seventeenth nineteen seventy two stated that the departments would be required to submit plans to the white house outlining the ways in which each department could respond to re-election needs accordingly the department and agency heads in their briefings with malik and members of his staff were instructed to prepare and present such plans the select committee has been unable to establish that any formalized plans of this nature were actually submitted to the white house in fact it has received evidence that the white house did not receive a single written plan from a department or agency the experience at the labor department is instructive the task of formulating labor's plan was given by secretary james hodgson to lawrence silberman the under secretary of labor now the deputy attorney general after meeting with malik mr silberman requested that various assistant secretaries and other high labor officials submit to him their proposals as to how their operations could contribute to the president's re-election various plans were received some of which are collected at exhibit number fourteen along with certain weekly reports submitted to silverman's office respecting activity taken to support the campaign but no comprehensive labor plan was drafted for submission to malik silverman made an attempt but later assigned the task to his assistant richard wise wise's unfinished handwritten draft is found at exhibit number fifty three silberman testified at the confirmation hearing for his present position that he felt uncomfortable about submitting an election plan to malik and thus decided not to do so none the less the memorandums collected at exhibit number fourteen are instructive as to the potential for abuse that underlay the responsiveness program a june nineteenth nineteen seventy two memorandum for the under secretary from malcolm r lovell jr the assistant secretary for manpower details how many millions of dollars up to one hundred and eighty five million from manpower training services and e e a money quote, can potentially be utilized for the purposes we discussed the memorandum continues quote, as we develop plans for the allocation of the discretionary funds i will coordinate closely with you in order to get maximum beneficial utilization of these funds End quote. however both mr silberman and mr lovell have stated that the proposal for using labor funds for the purposes referenced in this memorandum was never implemented a june fourteenth nineteen seventy two memorandum to the under secretary from george c gunther assistant secretary for the occupational safety and health administration also contains several interesting statements Quote, gunther under the heading action stated that during the campaign period while promulgation and modification activity must continue no highly controversial standards that is cotton dust etc will be proposed by osha or by n i o s h a thorough review with n i o s h indicates that while some criteria documents such as on noise 
will be transmitted to us during this period neither the contents of these documents nor our handling of them here will generate any substantial controversy while the activities of the standards advisory committee on agriculture will commence in july the committee will concentrate on priorities and long-range planning rather than on specific standards setting during this period other standards advisory committees may be proposed during this period but again their activities will be low-keyed mr silverman stated to the select committee that he did not instruct mr gunther to discontinue the apparent plan set forth in this paragraph two under the heading personnel gunther wrote we are drafting an outline of osha's recruiting and hiring plan for the next six months subject to your approval it is our intention to provide copies of this detailed plan to the republican national committee and the committee to re-elect the president we can then consider applicants they propose End quote. the original document contains a no by this paragraph written by mr wise to indicate his and mr silverman's disapproval of this proposal three finally gunther stated while i have discussed with lee nunn the great potential of osha as a sales point for fundraising and general support by employers i do not believe the potential of this appeal is fully recognized your suggestions as to how to promote the advantages of four more years of properly managed osha for use in the campaign would be appreciated End quote. no action was taken respecting this paragraph b dahl migrant labor grant one success announced by malik to haldeman in the june seventh nineteen seventy two progress report was actually resolved contrary to malik's claim due to intransigence to white house pressure this document contained the following statement senator tower's office requested that the two point two million migrant worker program grant be given to the pro administration lower rio grande valley development council as opposed to the consortium of o e o c a p agencies d o l has already announced that the o e o groups have the best proposal if the development council were to receive the grant there would be a significant plus for the administration as oeo's negative voice would be silenced and the council's positive feelings towards the administration could be stressed dol has told power that the grant will be awarded to tower's choice tower will confirm his decision this week End quote. summarizing this result malik wrote the department of labor was asked to award a 2.2 million migrant labor program contract in texas to a pro-administration group labor had already publicly committed itself to a consortium of anti-administration oeo cap agencies labor has reversed its stand End quote but labor department records reveal that the oeo cap agencies were eventually funded the project was approved on october twenty second nineteen seventy two albeit at a lower rate of one point seven million dollars while white house pressure caused a delay in funding the grant did go to the group that labor deemed superior End quote. c approach to hud richard goldstein in nineteen seventy two was a special assistant to richard van dusen then under secretary of hud mr goldstein has submitted an affidavit to the committee that includes the following statements sometime in the summer of nineteen seventy two after mr malik had left the white house staff to join the committee to re-elect the president i received a telephone call from mr davidson in the course of which he asked that the department set aside approximately two to three million dollars that could be used in the state of california as part of the responsiveness program under mr davidson's proposal an individual whom the white house would designate but who would not be an employee of the department of housing and urban development with an appropriate delegation of authority from the secretary would make the decision as to how those monies were to be committed i e which cities and towns in california would receive those funds 
i told mr davidson that in my judgment such a program did not make sense that it sounded illegal and certainly improper and that i felt confident that hud would not participate in such a program i further told mr davidson that if he wanted a decision from a higher authority that i would take the matter up with under secretary van dusen mr davidson suggested that i do that at the conclusion of my conversation with mr davidson i spoke with under secretary van dusen about the matter he agreed and told me that hud would in no way participate in such a program End quote. mr van dusen has confirmed that he had the conversation with goldstein reported in the latter's affidavit mr davison stated to the committee's staff that he does not recall making the specific request set forth in the goldstein affidavit d difficulties with o m b e john l jenkins served as director of the office of minority business enterprises o m b e at the department of commerce from august nineteen seventy one until march nineteen seventy three as indicated above o m b e was a substantial force of federal funding for minority businessmen several memorandums reveal the dissatisfaction of white house and campaign officials respecting jenkins lack of responsiveness to campaign needs on march third nineteen seventy two malik forwarded a memorandum to robert brown william marimoto paul jones and alex armandares who were leaders in the campaign effort regarding black and spanish-speaking voters this memorandum stated quote, each of you has expressed concern to me recently about the use of o m b e grants this obviously represents an excellent opportunity to make a contribution and gain headway in the black and spanish-speaking areas i have discussed this situation with ken cole and we are in agreement on the importance of this program to our efforts however if we are to be at all effective in the o m b e area we must ensure that the white house speaks with a single voice ken and i are agreed that that single voice will be john evans of the domestic council staff i believe assigning john the complete responsibility in this area can be quite effective and helpful to our efforts john has the same objectives that you do and i am sure you will find him most receptive to your inputs and needs in this regard i think it would be helpful if at an early stage you each sat down with john to discuss the blacks and spanish-speaking problems respectively to ensure he is fully apprised of your needs and that a meaningful liaison is established End quote. later documents however indicate that the jenkins o m b e problem was not solved on april eleventh nineteen seventy two jones sent a memorandum to robert odell which reported quote, we participated in meetings with white house team members to resolve problems centering around o m b e activities in efforts to assure that maximum benefits flow from this program End quote. and on july twenty first nineteen seventy two jones sent a memorandum to malik containing the following entry problem the inability after repeated high-level meetings to get favorable supportive responses from the office of minority business enterprises remains a continuing obstacle to best use of administration resources to meet critical needs End quote. jenkins testified before the select committee in executive session on february eighth nineteen seventy four he stated that from time to time he received telephone calls regarding grants from marimoto or rodriguez concerning pro-administration spanish-speaking firms and from brown or jones as to blacks favorable to the administration jenkins testified he would inform the caller that the grants were in the process and then would proceed to follow proper procedures as laid down by legislation and regulations he was aware however of the concern that he was not cooperative and of the rumors that he was not directing the money into the right hands jenkins testified at some length regarding the pressures brought to bear on him and his responses to them hirschman is it not true mr jenkins that pressures came from the white house and the committee to re-elect the president and the pressures took the form of influence centering around various grants and contracts awarded by your office 
jenkins i suppose they would term it pressure they would exert effort towards getting a particular proposal hirschman did they not make it clear to you that they wanted to see grants and contracts going to firms minority firms who were supportive of the administration jenkins well this was made in a statement and maybe this is where my division with the white house came we felt that even though this was made in a statement that they still wanted us to follow the prescribed rules and regulations that had been established by the congress to award a grant or contract to an individual firm and that is very well where i probably fell in disfavor if it was such at the white house because i did not deviate from that particular performance and we were told that we should be very attentive to those persons and organizations who were favorable to the president and we took that under consideration within the guidelines of the requirements and criteria and quote when shown memorandums critical of his performance jenkins said i would say that it was all brought about because of a few small-minded people in the white house who felt that i had not cooperated with what they wanted done End quote. jenkins said that he was not previously aware of the march third malik memorandum quoted above relating to the appointment of john evans as the o m b e contact but continued quote, since i see the memo i can see some connection because i was giving everybody a fit over there and marimoto would call me bob would call me norris sidner would call me and i probably was not responding like they wanted me to so uh, it was probably a memo going to malik saying we are not getting the juice out of ombe that we should be getting out of it and consequently this memo came out and they appointed john End quote. jenkins testified that he finally went to then department of commerce under secretary james lynn to complain about the pressures on him in a meeting attended by marimoto rodriguez lynn and jenkins lynn explained that jenkins had certain rules and regulations and requirements that had to be met and that he was moving on all projects that had some viability to them lynn stated to the committee that certain white house staffers were impatient with jenkins but that he jenkins was attempting to carry out his o m b e duties in a responsible manner part seven purported cancellation of the responsiveness program malik moved from the white house to the campaign as deputy director on july first nineteen seventy two daniel kingsley still at the white house assumed administrative responsibility for the responsiveness program at that time a progress report from kingsley to haldeman which the select committee has not obtained apparently prompted the official if not the actual cancellation of the responsiveness program the events leading to this cancellation are set forth in an affidavit submitted to the select committee by frank herringer a former malik assistant now the administrator of the urban mass transit authority Quote, some time later probably during september nineteen seventy two a carbon or xerox copy of a progress report on the responsiveness project from kingsley to haldeman crossed my desk on its way to malik i do not recall any specifics of the report but i believe it was similar to an earlier progress report which was shown to me recently and which is in the select committee's possession i scanned the report or part of it briefly and i recall that i was generally disturbed by the descriptions in the report of some of the individual actions that supposedly had occurred in the responsiveness project while i did not believe that anything inappropriate had actually occurred i felt that the exaggerated tone of the report as is equally true in the earlier report could cause someone not familiar with the general staff practice of exaggerated writing to think that inappropriate activities were being carried on i sent the copy of the progress report along to malik with a suggestion that he recommend to haldeman that the project or at least the reports be discontinued and possibly with a suggested draft memorandum for malik to send to haldeman if he agreed a few days later kingsley's secretary collected from my secretary materials in malik's and my files 
relating to the early stages of the development of the responsiveness project as far as i can recall that was the last i ever heard of the project End quote. it appears that all the responsiveness documents collected by kingsley were burned or otherwise destroyed because of their politically sensitive nature the select committee obtained copies of the majority of the responsiveness documents contained in this report from c r p files of malik and others that were preserved at the national archives malik essentially confirms the account set forth in the herringer affidavit malik stated to the committee that after the watergate affair broke he felt the campaign should be free of all conduct that might be subject to misinterpretation it appears however from numerous documents the select committee has obtained that activities of the responsiveness type continued past september until the conclusion of the campaign without referencing all available documents the committee notes a november second nineteen seventy two confidential memorandum from alex armendariz to kenneth cole suggesting that la raza unida a spanish-speaking organization potentially hostile to the president might remain neutral through the election if some of the government programs affecting its interests could be sprung loose within the next few days eight discussion throughout its investigation of the activities described in this chapter the select committee was met with the claim that this conduct is politics as usual that other administrations have similarly employed the resources at their command to ensure the incumbent's re-election because the select committee's investigation was limited by the senate in senate resolution sixty to the 1972 campaign and election the committee cannot confirm or refute these charges footnote one could however speculate with some confidence that no other administration was as victimized by its passion to commit its plans and stratagems for using federal resources to paper as was the present one of interest in this regard is a may twenty fourth nineteen seventy two confidential eyes only memorandum from l j evans to malik carrying the prescription burn before reading by which malik wrote always perhaps unfortunately for those involved many documents unearthed by the committee were not always burned before or after reading and footnote but to some degree the contention that other administrations have done the same thing misses the point for as the discussion that follows demonstrates certain of the activities described not only appear to contravene the fundamental notion that our nation's citizens are entitled to equal treatment under the laws but also raise questions as to the applicability of specific federal civil and criminal statutes it is useful to begin this discussion by referencing the admonition of the supreme court in the recent case of united states civil service commission et al versus national association of letter carriers afl cio et al four thirteen u s five forty eight and five sixty four through five nineteen seventy three quote it seems fundamental in the first place that employees in the executive branch of the government or those working for any of its agencies should administer the law in accordance with the will of congress rather than in accordance with their own or the will of a political party they are expected to enforce the law and execute the programs of the government without bias or favoritism for or against any political party or group or the members thereof it is not only important that the government and its employees in fact avoid practicing political justice but it is also critical that they appear to the public to be avoiding it if confidence in the system of representative government is not to be eroded to a disastrous extent End quote. in this case the supreme court affirmed the constitutionality of a portion of the hatch act five u s c seventy three twenty four a two which proscribes certain political activities by most federal employees the hatch act in fact contains another broad prescription that would seem to prohibit many of the activities described above 
section seventy three twenty four a one of title five provides that an employee of an executive agency may not use his official authority or influence for the purpose of interfering with or affecting the result of an election violation of this provision can result in dismissal from federal service c five u s c seventy three twenty five while this provision suffers from some vagueness and has never received an authoritative interpretation by the courts its applicability must none the less be considered in determining the propriety of the conduct presented in this chapter moreover the question is raised whether certain conduct described in this chapter may have amounted to a conspiracy to defraud the united states under eighteen u s c three seventy one the most authoritative definition of this crime appears in the supreme court's decision in hammerschmidt v united states two sixty five u s one eighty two one eighty eight nineteen twenty three taft chapter j where the court said quote, to conspire to defraud the united states means primarily to cheat the government out of property or money but it also means to interfere with or obstruct one of its lawful governmental functions by deceit craft or trickery or at least by means that are dishonest it is not necessary that the government shall be subjected to property or pecuniary loss by the fraud but only that its legitimate official action and purpose shall be defeated by misrepresentation chicanery or the overreaching of those charged with carrying out the governmental intention see also e g dennis v united states three eighty four u s eight fifty five eight sixty one nineteen sixty six where the court observed that section three seventy one quote, reaches any conspiracy for the purpose of impairing obstructing or defeating the lawful functions of any department of government end quote. hass v henkel two sixteen u s four sixty two nineteen ten Tyner v. United States, 23 U.S., A.P.P., D.C., 1904. The evidence accumulated by the Select Committee presents the issues whether those administration and C.R.P. officials who agreed on plans to use federal resources for political ends were engaged in a conspiracy to interfere with or obstruct lawful government functions, and whether legitimate official action and purpose was defeated by the overreaching of those charged with carrying out the governmental intention end quote. it is also relevant that the major documents promulgating responsiveness plans were classified confidential extremely confidential or and or eyes only and noted that secrecy in the implementation of the proposal was of paramount necessity in order to avoid adverse publicity thus a question exists whether there was agreement to interfere with the lawful functions of government by deceit craft or trickery or means that are dishonest in any event there are specific federal criminal and civil statutes that appear applicable to the conduct herein described and of course any agreement to violate a federal criminal law could also be prosecuted under eighteen u s c three seventy one as a conspiracy to commit an offense against the united states certain criminal and civil statutes that appear relevant to the activity portrayed in this chapter are now discussed one the evidence suggests that one area of emphasis in the responsiveness program was the allotting or rechanneling of federal money funds for grants contracts loans and subsidies to target groups and areas in order to enhance the president's re-election chances and to individual applicants who were supportive of or would thereafter support the president section five nine five of title eighteen makes it illegal for quote, a person employed in any administrative position by the united states or by any department or agency thereof in connection with any activity which is financed in whole or in part by loans or grants by the united states or any department or agency thereof to use his official authority for the purpose of interfering with or affecting the nomination or the election of any candidate for the office of president etc 
the offence is a misdemeanor and is penalized by a fine of not more than one thousand dollars and or imprisonment of not more than one year there are however no reported cases under this section two the committee has received evidence raising the possibility that certain individuals were offered government benefits in exchange for political support or at the least political neutrality section six hundred of title eighteen makes it a misdemeanor punishable by a fine of up to a thousand dollars and or imprisonment up to one year to promise any government benefit quote, or any special consideration in obtaining such benefit to any person as consideration favor or reward for any political activity or for the support of or opposition to any candidate or any political party in connection with the federal election three there is evidence that plans were laid for government officials and others to solicit campaign contributions from minority recipients of federal grants loans and contracts moreover the committee has obtained evidence that these plans were in part consummated it also appears from civil service commission findings and otherwise that certain federal employees were solicited for campaign contributions by other federal employees on federal facilities several provisions of the federal criminal code are relevant regarding this conduct a section six eleven of title eighteen provides that any one entering into a contract with the united states for the rendition of personal services or furnishing any material supplies or equipment if payment for performance of such contract or payment for such material supplies or equipment is made in whole or in part from funds appropriated by the congress may not directly or indirectly make any contribution of money or other thing of value or promise expressly or implicitly to make any such contribution to any political party committee or candidate for public office or to any person for any political purpose or use a contribution or promise to contribute is only illegal if made during the time period from the beginning of negotiation on a government contract to the completion of the contract or the termination of negotiations respecting the contract whichever is later it is also illegal to solicit any such contribution from any such person for any such purpose during any such period penalty for violation is a fine of not more than five thousand dollars and or imprisonment for not more than five years b section six o two makes it criminal for an official or employee of the united states or a person receiving any salary or compensation for services from money derived from the treasury of the united states directly or indirectly to solicit receive or be in any manner concerned in soliciting or receiving any contribution for any political purpose whatever from any other such person this statute carries a fine of up to five thousand dollars and or imprisonment up to three years c section six o three makes it illegal for any one in any room or building occupied in the discharge of official duties by any person mentioned in section six o two to solicit or receive any contribution of money or other thing of value for any political purpose the penalties are the same as enumerated in section six o two d section six o seven makes it illegal for a federal employee to give a campaign contribution to another federal employee the penalties are the same as in sections 602 and 603 4 the march 17 may look to haldeman memorandum setting forth the basic precepts of the responsiveness program indicates that one of the goals of that program was the shaping of legal and regulatory proceedings to benefit the president's re-election campaign and in a malik to haldeman memorandum dated june seventh nineteen seventy two malik appears to claim that for campaign purposes his forces achieved successful results respecting eeoc and labor department proceedings section fifteen o five of title eighteen provides that 
whoever corruptly influences obstructs or impedes or endeavors to influence obstruct or impede the due and proper administration of the law under which a proceeding is being had before a department or agency of the united states shall be fined not more than five thousand dollars or imprisoned not more than five years or both five the evidence indicates that various federal employees were actively engaged in the president's re-election campaign it appears that some of these employees were not exempt from the provisions of the hatch act five u s c seventy three twenty four a two which provides that an employee in an executive agency may not take an active part in political management or in political campaigns violation of this provision may result in dismissal from office c five u s c seventy three twenty five six the select committee has received evidence suggesting that white house and campaign officials acting through special personnel referral units established in various departments and agencies were engaged in a program to place political supporters of the administration in government positions regulated by the civil service merit system that is competitive service positions it is unlawful for a department or agency to make determinations on staffing for competitive service positions on the basis of political considerations for example section four point two of executive order number one o five seven seven which was issued pursuant to five u s c three three o one provides that quote, no discrimination shall be exercised threatened or promised by any person in the executive branch of the federal government against or in favor of any employee in competitive service or any eligible or applicant for a position in the competitive service because of his political affiliation except as may be authorized or required by law other similar statements of the law are found at section seven point one of executive order number one o five seven seven section nine point five of the executive order number one one five nine eight and five c f r three hundred dot one o three c three three o dot one o one the committee rejects the proposition that much of the conduct described in this chapter should be viewed as acceptable political practice the responsiveness concept involved the diverting of taxpayers dollars from the primary goal of serving all the people to the political goal of re-electing the president to condone such activity would display a limited understanding of the basic notion that the only acceptable governmental responsiveness is a responsiveness to the legitimate needs of the american people section nine recommendations one prosecution for violations of the existing criminal statutes set forth above in so far as they relate to federal elections and the criminal statutory enactments recommended below should be entrusted to the public attorney whose establishment is elsewhere recommended the reasons supporting the committee's recommendation for a permanent public attorney are presented elsewhere in this report two the federal elections commission elsewhere recommended should be given authority to investigate and restrain violations of the federal civil and criminal statutes referred to in this chapter in so far as those violations relate to federal elections the commissions should also be empowered to refer evidence of such criminal violations to the public attorney the reasons supporting the committee's recommendation for the creation of a federal elections commission are presented elsewhere in this report as are the specifics concerning the recommended powers of this commission three the committee recommends that congress enact legislation making it a felony to obstruct impair or pervert a government function or attempt to obstruct impair or pervert a government function by defrauding the government in any manner as indicated above there is a question whether some of the conduct described in this chapter may have interfered with the lawful functioning of government certain of the endeavors described were pursued in concert there is for example evidence that the governmental officials and c r p personnel acted jointly in various attempts to use federal resources for re-election purposes 
as noted there is currently in the federal code a statute eighteen u s c three seventy one making it unlawful to conspire to defraud the united states the supreme court has ruled that a conspiracy to interfere with the lawful functioning of government is prosecutable under this provision the committee's recommendation which is an elaboration of the suggested provision in section one three o one of s fourteen hundred the department of justice bill now pending before the senate would make illegal individual conduct that fraudulently interferes with a lawful government function this recommendation coupled with existing eighteen u s c three seventy one should cover completely all future attempts by campaign officials government personnel and others to use federal resources to influence a federal election in a manner that interferes with lawful government functioning four the committee recommends that congress preserve as part of the united states code eighteen u s c five ninety five which makes it illegal for a government official connected with the awarding of federal grants and loans to use his official authority to effect a federal election but recommends that this offense be upgraded to a felony the committee recommends that eighteen u s c six hundred which makes illegal the promise of government benefit for political support be upgraded to a felony the committee also recommends that the scope of section five ninety five be expanded to include misuse of official authority in connection with the dispensing of other federal funds such as government contract payments and federal subsidies the major proposed revisions of the criminal code currently before congress s one the mcclellan bill s fourteen hundred the department of justice bill h r one o o four seven the brown commission recommendations would either seriously limit the scope of eighteen u s c five ninety five or altogether remove its strictures from the law this result in view of the factual findings in this chapter and the necessity of preserving the sanctity of the electoral process is undesirable to the contrary this provision and eighteen u s c six hundred should be upgraded to felony level better to protect the integrity of federal elections section five nine five as now written does not appear to deal with misconduct by certain federal officials who have important responsibilities for dispensing federal funds for example those dealing with government contracts and various federal subsidies in view of the evidence uncovered the scope of the statute should be expanded to cover conduct by these influential federal officials five the committee recommends that congress preserve in the united states code eighteen u s c six eleven which proscribes political contributions by or solicitations to government contractors and eighteen u s c six o two which makes illegal political solicitations by persons receiving federal compensation for services rendered to other such persons but appropriately amend these provisions to make illegal contributions by or knowing solicitations to a any person receiving during the calendar year a contribution or solicitation is made other federal monies that is grants loans subsidies in excess of five thousand dollars and b the principals or dominant shareholders of corporations receiving during the calendar year a contribution or solicitation is made s b a eight a or o m b e awards or other such federal funding designed to benefit disadvantaged and minority groups section six eleven only makes illegal contributions by or solicitations to contractors compensated by federal dollars it does not cover contributions by or solicitations to other recipients of significant federal funding for example certain grantees and loan recipients moreover the statute by its terms does not seem to cover contributions by or solicitations to principals or dominant stockholders of corporations receiving federal monies similarly section six o two only covers solicitations to those receiving federal compensation for services rendered it does not condemn solicitations to those receiving federal funding without returning services 
or solicitations to the principals or dominant shareholders and corporations that receive federal monies the evidence before the committee indicates that respecting minority groups plans were laid to solicit recipients of grants or loans also there appear to have been particular pressures to contribute on minority businessmen whose corporations were quite dependent on government business the law currently prohibits contributions by corporations to federal elections and we recommended elsewhere that a three thousand dollar limit be placed on the amount any individual can contribute to a presidential campaign the proposal to prohibit contributions by and knowing solicitations to the principals and dominant shareholders of corporate recipients of s b a eight a or o m b e awards or other federal funding designed to benefit disadvantaged and minority groups adds another protection to persons who are most dependent on federal funds and thus all the more susceptible to campaign solicitations by federal candidates or their representatives the current major bills to revise the criminal code before congress s one s fourteen hundred h r one o o four seven generally weaken the prescriptions in sections six o two and six eleven and lessen the penalties for their violation in view of the abuses discovered a weakening of the law in this area seems unwise six the committee recommends that congress amend the hatch act to place all justice department officials including the attorney general under its purview the evidence the select committee has gathered indicates that various federal officials took an active part in the president's nineteen seventy two re-election campaign some of the officials apparently involved were covered by the hatch act which prohibits certain federal employees from engaging in political campaigns and political management but some were not some of the federal officials who engaged in political activities were employed at the department of justice for example mr mitchell section seventy three twenty four d of title five exempts certain justice department officials from hatch act coverage the committee however believes that justice department officials should administer the nation's laws totally removed from all political considerations the committee thus recommends that all justice department employees and officials including the attorney general be placed under the hatch act seven the committee recommends that the appropriate committees of both houses of congress in accordance with their constitutional responsibilities maintain a vigilant oversight of the operations of the executive branch in order to prevent abuses of governmental processes to promote success in a federal election this proposal needs no discussion for an obvious major lesson of watergate is that vigorous congressional oversight of the executive branch is essential this ends section twenty seven and is the end of the final report of the senate select committee on presidential campaign activities volume one